I couldn't come to San Francisco without coming and checking out the famous Castro district. This is one of the most important sites in terms of LGBT history and LGBT activism, even to this day. If you go back to the 1960s, when all the hippies started taking over areas like Heights Ashbury, which is like a couple of streets and stupidly steep hills away, queer people on the other hand, came to the Castro district, which then became one of America's very first queer communities. I'm looking forward to exploring this. Let's have a look. I would say the Castro's most famous resident would have been Harvey Milk, I believe the first gay elected official in America. This was his original camera shop, which apparently was also a meeting place for a lot of activist activities before unfortunately he was eventually assassinated. An incredibly important and pioneering person for LGBT rights and LGBT history. These plaques are dotted all around the Castro district, which is really sweet. Part of the so-called Rainbow Honor Walk, honoring some really famous, really important LGBT people that have sort of pushed for equal rights uh, that have made this district so important. These rainbow crossings are so cute. Look at them, they're so cute. Twin Peaks is right behind me. So this is apparently the first gay bar here in the Castro district that had windows where you could actually see inside. Visibility, honey's visibility. This here is the Pink Triangle Park. You can kind of see the Pink Triangle in granite behind me. There you go, you can just about see it. This is dedicated to all the LGBT people that died in the Holocaust. So it's quite a, um, it's quite humbling to be here. Don't really know what else to say, just to appreciate being here. just been into the museum for the GLBT National Historical Society and what an incredible place, what an incredible purpose and what incredible work they do. There's some really quite amazing exhibitions that cover the full spectrum of LGBT plus people and the entire community. The history that stems from HIV and AIDS activism all the way to the incredibly tragic assassination of Harvey Milk that was, well, it's, yeah, very, very beautifully done. Wow. <laughs> I mean, there's so much history here and what an incredibly fascinating place. And it just kind of leaves me reflecting on everything that's happened before me so that I can sit here now as somebody that isn't likely to be assassinated for my views or for my activism. To be able to have the freedom to make videos like this and be visible as a member of the LGBT community, as somebody who's gay and who's queer, um, yeah, just leaves me very grateful. Let me know what you thought in the comments below as well, uh, and I'll see you for another video very soon. Bye. for being in the Castro district, my little office in Oxford. Um, one of the biggest, most wonderful aspects of being in the Castro district was learning aspects of LGBT history, particularly around pioneers like Harvey Milk. And this is more of a sort of social science-y LGBT history thing rather than mental health and mental, rather than mental health and mental illness per se. But I wanted to watch a clip of a key interview with Harvey Milk where he outlines some of his thoughts and his approaches to things um, that undoubtedly has shaped the way that LGBT rights have progressed, not just in San Francisco in the States, but around the world since then. Ready? Let's have a little look. Our guest this evening is Harvey Milk. Uh, the supervisor from San Francisco's 5th District, which includes the Castro area, Noe Valley, and the Haight-Ashbury. Mr. Milk is in real life a camera store owner. Camera shop owner, yes, but he was also the first openly gay man to be elected to public office in California. 
Supervisor, one of the things you've been associated with lately is you were sponsor of the uh, uh, law which prohibits discrimination of, against uh, gays in business and housing in San Francisco. Very briefly, can you describe the detail of that law? The law would make it a uh, offense, a uh, crime, in essence, a uh, civil crime. Uh, if you refuse to hire somebody, or you actually fired somebody who had employment because you found that the person was a gay person, or you refused to rent, or you refused to allow public accommodations solely on that, those grounds. It's pretty pioneering. We're looking at the 1970s here. In the UK, we have the Equality Act of 2010 that legally protects people from discrimination in wider society, including in the workplace. Before that, there were several more individual pieces of legislation designed to try and protect people. So there was the, uh, the Sex Discrimination Act, there was the Race Relations Act, and the Disability Discrimination Act. And instead, the Equality Act tries to cover uh, a wide range of people and a wide range of circumstances under one piece of legislation. This then made it easier to actually understand and therefore easier to enforce and therefore just a stronger and, and, and more robust piece of legislation. Uh, he was con his constituents were concerned, he said, that this would, for example, force private schools and parochial schools in the city to hire gay teachers no, it wouldn't when they wouldn't want to. Is that accurate? Is he, was okay. he wrong? It doesn't force you to hire. It says that you can't discriminate on those grounds. And all we're saying, basically, is that if a person is qualified to teach, uh, that's the only grounds you should hire or refuse to hire. This reminds me of Section 28 or Clause 28, which was before my time. It was in effect, I think, between 1988 and uh, 2003, I think it was repealed in England and Wales. Um, but this basically was a series of laws across Britain that prohibited the promotion of homosexuality by local authorities, including in schools. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. Vile. Absolutely vile. But we are seeing the same laws creeping back in, in some places about the wider LGBT community, but definitely focused on trans people. Does it concern you at all that... Uh that there is any kind of outrageous public behavior in, in, in the gay community. It concerns me that there's outrageous public behavior in every community. Um, I, but I understand some of that behavior too, you know, and I'm not I mean, excusing you, but it. But you know where, you know what, uh, her background, I, I hesitate to use the popular expression where she's coming from. Right, that's the you trouble. You know that there are a lot of people out there who, who, you know, drive or walk through Castro or Polk and say, oh my God, at least if, they're, if these people are going to okay. have you know, homosexual relationships, let them do it in private and I not agree. in public. I agree. Don't scare the horses. Oh, this is the same line of thoughts that people say, oh, people are just too gay, i.e. being too camp or too femme. Um, you know, just don't force it down my throat. Those are straights have an obsession with things being forced down their throat. Um, and, and it's the same thing that drove the don't ask, don't tell policies and those same attitudes that still are pervasive today. Gay people historically and even today, really, are thrown out of the homes. Most families don't accept their child when they're gay. Um, the church throws them out. The Most Holy Redeemer, a block and a half away from Castro, will not accept them in. The Lions Club, the social clubs don't accept them. The um, unions, basically, most of them don't accept them. There's no place to go. The gay bar becomes the family, the church, the social club. It becomes a meeting gathering place because of nothing else. So naturally, they're gonna come meet there. And he's absolutely right. You've got to understand why people are doing what they're doing and how these senses of community work. That if people are completely rejected from their actual family, then they will form chosen families in places where they feel connected with people and accepted by people. He said that most people are not accepted by their families. I would like to think we've moved to a point where most people are, though there's still a ridiculously high proportion, an unacceptable proportion that aren't. But I'd like to think that's somewhere that we've actually progressed as a, a global society. Maybe I'm being optimistic, I don't know. Soto, who is handicapped and whose parents found out that he's gay and wanted to commit him to an asylum, and you become his lifeline, then you know you're going to do a good job. And we're talking here in the 19, early 1970s. So homosexuality was removed as a mental illness in the DSM, I think in the third edition in 1973. So there's a very good chance at the time this interview was being filmed that homosexuality was still a mental disorder and therefore something that psychiatrists still deem worthy of treatment um, and fully in the asylum culture where people would be admitted to hospital for this reason. Um, and 
a subject for another video about the range of different interventions that were used and have been used as so-called conversion therapy, um, a lot of which have been pretty barbaric. So you can start to see the way that some of the legislation and the attitudes that we have today have grounding from 40, 50 years ago. Um, and I don't underestimate the importance of the influence of people like Harvey Milk in shaping who I am today, the world that I live in today, um, the challenges that I face, but also the challenges that I haven't had to face because of what people like him have done. And I'd encourage anybody that's in San Francisco, particularly if you are part of the LGBTQ plus community, to spend a few hours and just absorb it and be grateful. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching and I will see you for another video very soon. Thanks. Bye.